Welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Before we jump into episode two, I'd like to go over some things in episode one I neglected to go over concerning strategy and whatnot, so you guys aren't left in the dark. The first order of business would be in mission control where I can go over the contracts we went through. First launch is the only one available to us at the beginning, which you complete and get some funds there. And after completing that, you have access to a handful of contracts and you can accept a total of three of them. And I based these mostly off of things I can complete, but also funds I can collect, especially advanced, because you, you get that money without having to do anything. And that is great for starting off the program and dumping points into upgrades for KCT. But I'll go over that in just a little bit. So Carmen Line was the first one we got. Just reach 100 kilometers, which is something we did with the first launch. So of course we're gonna do it again. The next contract I accepted immediately was this one, Downrange Milestone. So reach a downrange distance of 3 million meters, which we're going to need about 6,000 meters per second of Delta V to do so, and I'm going to be trying to do that very soon. Oh, it also has to be suborbital, by the way. But the advance of this 29k funds was very nice for the first year. The third contract we accepted was this one, Altitude Sounding Rocket Difficult. I ended up canceling this one and getting more funds, even though I've lost 6k funds there, which is a little bit unfortunate. I, I canceled it to grab this one instead towards the end of the year when we were building the Kel X1. I'll go over that in just a sec as well. But after completing the uh, Sound Barrier Crude mission, we ended up accepting another contract as well. This one reach a suborbital trajectory and return, and we're gonna be trying to do this with one of our sounding rockets. Heading on over to the R&D building, we'll see the two tech nodes that we unlocked during the first year. That would be post-war rocketry testing, which gave us access to the XLR-11, as well as the XLR-41. This engine, we finally have an American big boy engine that we're going to be using. Um, and then we also unlocked this cockpit and supersonic wings for the Kel x one These two nodes are what made that X-Plane possible. Now you can see the ones with the yellow are what we're researching currently. So let's jump back into the Space Center menu to see in what order we're doing things. Okay, back out here, just to go over the tech, looks like we have early rocketry, post-war materials science, tracking systems, early science, early materials science. And this is how long they will take once they start going. So it starts adding up. It's gonna take a long time for these, which is why I really like to speed up the R&D. That's pretty much my strategy for this playthrough is I'm going to try to put as much of our money into making the research very fast as possible. What this ends up meaning is launches are a lot more meaningful and failures hurt a lot more. But concerning the upgrade points we put in, at the end of the first episode, at the end of 1951 here, we have two points in the vehicle assembly building, four in the space plane hangar, and six in the R&D building. And you'll see here we actually have one more available, but I'm not sure where I want to put it quite yet. Um, but this is the status of our program at the end of 1951. Now, without further ado, let's jump into the next episode of For All Kerbal Kind. All right, first up, we have the first speed build footage of the series. We've got word the Soviet Union has built a much more powerful and capable rocket than our skimpy little whack corporal sounding rockets, so America must rise to the occasion and build a rocket of their own. Now this rocket is called the K-4 and is using our new XLR-41 engine which is sort of an Americanized version of the V2. The purpose for this rocket is very simply to see how much Delta V we can get from it. This is being built in 1951 before a few more tech nodes unlock, and I believe the final result is around 5,000 or 5,000 something meters per second uh, with one of our sounding rockets on top of it as well. We slap the upper stage of a WAC Corporal on top of this, creating sort of a bumper rocket which I believe is very common in early game RP1. Unfortunately, I did things rather inefficiently for the sake of getting a rocket capable and built 
in as little amount of time as possible. So halfway through building this rocket with KCT, a few tech nodes unlocked. The first we could utilize, we got a tech node that gave us another engine config for the Airb engine, the AJ10 config, which is the most powerful and efficient Airb engine to date. I don't think there's any upgrades after it. And that alone was enough to get our Delta V up a little bit short of 6K, but I figured we might as well try for it anyway. And by it, I mean the 3000 kilometer downrange contract. That contract is sort of just in our way and is a stepping stone to bigger and greater things such as the first artificial satellite. As for the tech node that unlocked halfway through construction that I didn't have access to, that would be a tank upgrade from steel to aluminum, which are much lighter tanks. Unfortunately, I had already tooled the steel tank and the amount of money needed to tool an aluminum uh, variant of the same rocket was more than I had. See, I have been sort of running this program really close to the edge. I didn't show it in the previous episode, but when we launched the Kel X1 aircraft, our program had only 666 funds remaining. So that's sort of been a thing in early game. Um, <clears throat> it should be fine. That shouldn't bite us in the butt at all. So a new rocket is under construction, scheduled to complete halfway through the year. Contracts are sorted, and we are ready to start our second year towards getting to the moon. January 2nd, 1952. Peter and Milton get their wings again after the holidays. The duo take off from Brownsville, Texas in a Kedior aircraft set on flying over and photographing the Sierra Madre mountain range in Mexico, as their fellow pilots had the month previous. 22 minutes into the flight, they reach their destination only to realize the onboard camera is faulty. They turn around intent on returning to the KSC to resupply their onboard camera. However, several minutes later, pilot error leads to aerodynamic stresses ripping off the tail wing of the aircraft. The two pilots immediately regain control of the aircraft and find a suitable place to land and assess the situation. The Kedior remains surprisingly stable despite the structural failure, and the pilots take note of this. Peter and Milton take a moment to step outside of the aircraft, debating what they should do. Eventually, they come to the conclusion not to wait for Foundation rescue, due to the nature of international complications, and decide to attempt to take off without a tail wing. After getting up to speed, the aircraft does not provide enough lift to leave the surface, and even worse, begins to slip to one side. The takeoff is aborted, the brakes are engaged, and the aircraft rapidly slows down before sideslipping into a roll. Structural integrity is only slightly compromised further, but the two pilots now have no choice but to wait for rescue due to the nature of the aircraft now being upside down. Both pilots refuse to fault the other for this incident, taking the responsibility for the loss of the aircraft together. However, it is worth noting, after the pilots reported initial stability of the aircraft losing its tail wings, interest in a full delta wing design has started to make its way around the design team. Another Kedior is ordered and will arrive in about three months. And meanwhile, Peter and Milton are still allowed to fly for the time being, despite the failed mission. January 14th, 1952. The Kel X-1, after long debate on the safety of such a feat, is given another mission. The X-1 is to be mounted to a carrier aircraft and dropped from its wing to reduce drag from the atmosphere compared to launching from sea level, a similar concept to that of black powder missions in 1951. January 24th, 1952. Eileen straps herself to the Kel X-1 rocket plane mounted to its carrier and takes off from Texas heading east into the Gulf of Mexico and then turns around heading west back towards the KSC. Approaching 50 kilometers from the coast, as high as 7,600 meters at 150 meters per second, 
Eileen is dropped from the wing of her carrier and lights up the Dwal XLR-11s. She immediately discovers the flaps mistakenly deployed, causing an initial dive of the aircraft. However, the problem is remedied, and Eileen levels out the Kel X-1 as it screams above the KSC, reaching a top speed of 621 meters per second in level flight at roughly 8 kilometers altitude. The Kel X-1 coasts for a few minutes as Eileen orients herself towards the runway 27. Upon approach, it is determined the speed and current instability are both too high to land at the runway, and since the X-1 is currently a glider, there is likely not enough speed or time to go around for another pass. Eileen glides the aircraft to flat area west of the KSC, touches down and brings the aircraft to a halt. No structural damage is reported, and upon recovery, Eileen is considered another great American hero. Both Eileen and Gerald end up on the front page of Life magazine. February 25th, 1952. A WAC Corporal 3 is rolled out onto the small launch pad at the KSC, intent on reaching space with the upgraded Araby engines and returning to the surface via parachute safely. The missile's systems are functional, but a structural mishap upon ignition and separation of the powerful Tiny Tim motor causes the missile to limp westward towards inland Mexico. Range safety is ordered at T plus 1 minute and 6 seconds, resulting in mission failure. April 21st, 1952, Peter and Milton take off in the morning piloting the new Kidior aircraft to perform their intended mission which ended in catastrophe three and a half months ago. The flight goes off without a hitch, and for the first time, Peter and Milton did not experience a mission or flight failure, much to the relief of themselves as well as the flight team back at the KSC. All current biome-specific science experiments have now been carried out above the Sierra Madre Mountains and surrounding areas. Alright, current status of our program after the successful KDR flights, we have the next thing coming up is the early tracking systems, which gives us an upgrade to our science core avionics, which isn't really, well, all that necessary for us at the moment. Um, next up, we have two things, early science, which gives us more science experiments, and then early material science, which is sort of a major node that unlocks others and these are going to take a long time. So what we're gonna be doing now is focusing our program on getting money. This K4 flight is going to attempt to complete this downrange milestone contract. And the WAC Corporal 4 is going to be attempting reach suborbital trajectory and return contract. This one will be completed probably by K4 after it completes this one. Uh, it's, it's rather simple and easy money but we definitely need to bolster our funds because right now we don't have a lot in the VAB, we don't have a ton in the R&D, and I want to boost both of these up by a lot. We need to speed up our program as much as possible. However, the there's just some things in the way, such as this contract, completing it. Uh, best of luck here. Twenty third, 1952. Project Black Powder receives its most powerful unguided multi-stage missile yet, the K-4. Utilizing brand new propulsion technology, its goal is to break a downrange mark of 3,000 kilometers. Resting at a slight angle off the pad, the K-4 lifts off from Brownsville, Texas, and begins to spin stabilize itself via rotated fins on the upper stage as it angles its trajectory across the Gulf of Mexico. At T plus 1 minute and 14 seconds, the WAC Corporal 4 upper stage lights its brand new AJ-10 Aero-V engine, and the K-4 first stage is jettisoned, left to splash down into the Gulf. 
the upper stage fires for another 1 minute and 9 seconds, reaching its final trajectory with speeds of 4,722 meters per second, which will reach 623 kilometers altitude soaring above the Gulf of Mexico and over Florida. All systems work nominally during this launch, and K-4 sends the Corporal 3,100 kilometers downrange before re-entering the atmosphere disintegrates the missile at T plus 16 minutes and 20 seconds. We've got this contract here that we are able to complete with the Cal X1, so we're gonna go ahead and accept that. Awesome. All right, so this is refueled and everything. Um, however, uh, I've noticed uh, I, I could probably replace the engines. That might cost a bit. These still have two ignitions remaining. They started with four, and we haven't had a failure yet. But we haven't had any preflight on this either, so I'm a bit concerned. Maybe our luck will run out. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and enable the preflight to get our percentage failure rate a little bit lower. Uh, however, that's going to take almost a hundred days now. So we're going to save those edits and it's probably just going to take a bit in a hundred days and we will do our rocket plane contract. All right, halfway through 1952, June 23rd right now, we're looking at what kind of tech we can unlock since we have 29.8 science. And eventually for making our way towards the, well, first satellite contracts, I kind of want to go the route of the Explorer 1 or maybe even Vanguard. So we're looking at this engine right here for the first stage. I'm looking at these solids for our baby sergeant's um, boosters. So I definitely want to make my way towards there and just count out the signs. We got 10, 11, 12, uh, 6, no, 17, and 20. Now what order do we want to do that in? I think basic rocketry is going to be first there. Um, not sure if we want to go if we want to get saddle or uh, solar panels quite yet but i think these avionics might be useful as well hmm that and i think then we're going to go down to this note here afterwards and after that happens so 23 left we're going to make our way through the solids here we're going to actually get these two solid nodes right away for possible sounding rockets and all that goodies. Uh, but then this one, the 10 science, these, these are always going to be big nodes here. Uh, and a lot of them sometimes don't have anything like you see these two. However, what they hold is a key to unlock a whole other line of things. So these will always be in the way and we're going to kind of want to do them. Like we don't want to get one tree really far ahead and the other one behind. We want to do them in tandem. Uh, I'm going to wait on solar panels. We're going to grab satellite era materials, science, get that started, and then move our way towards unlocking this one with five science. We've got 6.8 left over, um, and I think we're going to want to slap it into the supersonic flights eventually because this will get us a nice upgrade to 75 kilometers, which is going to be good for X-plane flights for sure. Now with 4.8 science left over, we could use this to get an upgrade to air launch level 3, some nice aerodynamic stuff in there, but honestly, I'm not entirely too certain 
what I want to do with these. So I'm going to leave them there for right now. So this is what we are researching at the current time. We'll see how long they're going to take in just a second here. Let's open up KCT. Tech, yeah, we've got a long list of things being researched. This one here almost taking an entire year to unlock. So, oh, this one almost two years. So we're looking at oh, uh, quite a few years right now, but as we get more money completing more contracts, we will dump more funds into the R&D to speed this up and make that happen a little bit faster. But that's where we are currently. Okay, this is the K4 rocket that made the downrange contract. What I'm looking to do is adapt it in order to complete the two contracts I have here. Having 75 units of sounding payload on the vehicle, and making a much shorter distance, so we don't really need two stages for this, I don't think. And also reach suborbital trajectory and return. Uh, returning home safely, that should be well, pretty interesting. Maybe we can slap a science experiment on there. Who knows? So the first thing we're gonna do is get that sounding rocket payload. So let's go ahead and make some adjustments to this rocket. Okay, I ran a simulation and this seems to work perfectly. I actually don't remember the downrange, but I think that it was effective enough for this. It was definitely effective enough to get suborbital and return. Um, when this piece actually jettisons, because of where the center of mass ends up, this does not nosedive into the atmosphere. It's sort of like belly flops, which is good because that means our parachutes can deploy successfully. And this gets us about three science every time. As for the rocket launch, it's gonna like tip over slowly to around 45 degrees. And then it will, at that point, it'll be going fast enough that it will actually keep us about 45 degrees. And just before engine cutoff, we're going quite fast and it almost becomes unstable, but it seems to work absolutely perfect for this design. So we're gonna go ahead and tool this, which will cost 4,280 funds. And that brings the rocket cost down to 500 and it'll take 119 days. But we are gonna put some points into the VAB and some points into the R&D building. So let's save this and have one built. We're gonna add one to the building plans just to quickly build one in case, oops, in case anything happens. So let's go out and spend some KCT points to try to speed up our VAB times and our research times, because right now they are quite slow. And like I said previously, I still want to keep R&D above everything else, because we want to get through those tech nodes fast. That is my strategy. So let's see what upgraded points we have available to us. Six and four. Well, space plane at four right now is probably okay. So let's go ahead and spend some. I do want a little bit just to buy the new things that we purchased. So I'm thinking four points. Eh, we're brought down to 64K. That should be okay. That should be okay. What we're gonna do, uh, what we're gonna do is put two in the VAB and two in R&D. Now let's take a look at our VAB times. It's 60 days for our next whack corporal. And we brought that down to about 100 days for the K42, which should be, yeah, we should do that in this year for sure. For the space plane, yeah, it'll still take about 98 days for that. We didn't move the space plane hangar, but for these, that one that took 360 or so, and this one's 600 some, like we brought that down by uh, quite a lot with those, with just those two. So our research is going to increase little by little. But now we all we have to do is wait for our next launches. Looks like the first one's gonna be a whack corporal, and then it will be well the Kel X1, and then after that the K42, and we'll see what we can do after that. 
August 24th, 1952. A WAC Corporal 4 is propped up on the launch area early in the morning. Designed to simply reach a suborbital altitude and return safely to Earth, the missile takes off into the sky. All looks nominal, but moments later, the first Air B engine fails, meaning it will not reach space today. A few moments later, the missile experiences minor structural failure, but the parachute deploys and brings the rest back to the surface safely. October 13th, 1952. Milton Kerman is assigned a slot for an X-1 flight, this time shooting for an altitude mark of 12 and a half kilometers. Midday, he is detached from the carrier heading towards Texas, 7,600 meters from the surface at 150 meters per second. He lights up the engine and soars into the sky, reaching 4.4 Gs at full burn. Milton reaches 13.7 kilometers at 775 meters per second before pitching down to glide back to the runway. Upon touching down, Milton does not engage the brakes or parachute right away, and while rolling at 90 meters per second, the right wing touches the runway tearing off the structural plating intended to keep the wing from breaking upon impact with the ground, necessary for this kind of landing. Milton realizes this and utilizes roll to ensure the right wing does not again touch down, as well as applying brakes and deploying the landing chute. The X-1 momentarily drifts off the right side of the runway, but is kept in control and slides to a halt back on the tarmac. Milton is a bit shaken, but otherwise in good spirits. The ground team finds him assessing the aircraft, which has endured slight structural abuse from the landing and will need to be refurbished before it is flight ready once again. After Milton's successful X-plane flights, we are looking at a, our second experimental rocket plane contract, launch a crew to 15 kilometers at about 400 meters per second. And this should be very easy to do with the exact same thing. All we have to do is, well, fix up the aircraft and get it going. So we're gonna accept this contract. And now we're up to 78K again, which makes me think maybe we should put another point into either the VAB or R&D or maybe both. I guess it all comes down to what the cost of some of the next parts we're gonna be unlocking are. Like this one at 33K, um, some of these boosters are gonna be 35K, some new tanks. I don't know if these really cost anything other than the actual parts, yeah. Balloon tanks will be nice. Integral, integral structure will be nice, 45K. So we're gonna need some funds to unlock some stuff. So I'm actually not going to put any more upgrade points in there quite yet, because we do need that money to buy new parts that we unlock. Um, it's sort of a balance between, you know, unlocking parts fast enough and still being, uh, still building rockets fast enough to utilize that tech before it becomes outdated. And at the same time, keeping as much money as possible, or not as much money as possible, as little money as possible in order to buy the new parts I unlock. So that's sort of the balance that's going on right here. I'm gonna leave it as it is right now because we don't have a lot, but yeah, we are going to fix up the, yeah, the Kel X1 here and possibly have a slot for that next year. And I think the final launch of this year is going to be our K4 II, which we built earlier. Hopefully that will work out as well as getting some new science nodes looks like awesome that's gonna be it for the rest of the year so let's get on that december 2nd 1952 early in the morning another k4 unguided rocket is rolled out onto the launch pad this time carrying a small payload for the u.s air force as well as a fruit flies experiment which the WAC corporal missions had failed to reach zero g with the rocket successfully lights and lifts off from Texas, tilting 45 degrees over the Gulf of Mexico. After burning out and slightly stabilizing in the upper atmosphere, the payload is jettisoned from the rocket and left to tumble past the Kármán line and into space. Upon re-entry, the payload belly flops into the atmosphere before allowing the parachutes to deploy and be brought safely back to the Earth for recovery some time later. Foundation, crew, and faculty relax after another successful year comes to a close. 
However, Intel suggests the Soviet program is on par, if not ahead of us, in several aspects. Their experimental aircraft program is much more active and has flown higher than us. In September, the first Earth organisms to reach space were Russian. And in mid-December, reports suggest work towards collecting the first pictures of Earth from space is taking place. The Foundation has its work cut out for it in 1953. If you'd like to see what the Soviets have been up to this episode, a link is in the end screen as well as the description to Beardy's video. Anyways, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out.